chapter 1, what we're going to be looking at. We started a uh, Christmas series, I know, before Thanksgiving last week, and we're going to go through the next couple weeks looking at a Christmas story and different little aspects of it. Um, before I really get started, I, mean, I, I really want to tell you, I really believe everything I say. I, I mean, that was something that touched my heart years ago. I found that little book. It is called You Are Special. And... I don't care how old you are, and I've come to learn, you know, even though we've got, in, in my job that I do on a daily basis, I run into people who have lost their way. And I can't help but think if somebody had just taken the time with them, a church member, anybody, and just showed them that God does love them, that they don't have to be perfect. We are not a perfect church. I'm not a perfect pastor. I'm not a perfect person, but I have a perfect God who loves me. And he knows that when I fall, he will pick me up. He will wipe me off the mud off of me. And he will give me purpose and a vision to move on. And we in this world all want the grandeur. We all want the fame. We all want the fortune. We all want the everything that we can do. But the thing is, God says you are special right where you're at. And I truly believe that this morning. And, and I share with you that you are so special enough that God sent his son to die on a cross for you. Because he wants to be with you. That we are not as small, that, that we're too small that he doesn't care about us. He made us the way we are. And so much so that he gave us a book to tell us about his relationship with us. And as we talked last week and as we saw, God had this divine plan all the way from the beginning of the fall. The beginning plan was him to be and walk in the garden with Adam and Eve and walk with us in perfect harmony. And then sin came into this world. And from that day forward, God had a plan. And that plan was to reconcile us with him all the way back to the beginning. And we talked about all the prophecy that there is, that there's over 300 prophecies about Jesus, the Messiah, and he fulfilled all of them. And that we saw just a couple of them, how it was fulfilled. And we got to the lineage at the end there, talking about the lineage of Jesus Christ and how it ruled all the way back to Abraham and to Noah and all the way back to Adam in the beginning. That the King of Kings came here on this planet to restore us, and it is the story of the Messiah. And so we saw that he is coming as we're getting ready for Christmas. And we've seen, I talked about the prophecy last week. I want to take a couple of the characters in the next couple of weeks. And this week we're going to talk about Joseph the man. There's not much that we know about him. It's just a couple of scriptures uh, with him. But there is a big, big message that we can extract just from a few sentences that we learn about the father uh, the what you want to call the stepfather or you want to call the earthly father of Jesus Christ here on this planet that we can extract from. Now, when you think of loving and wonderful and outstanding marriages throughout history, you probably do not think about Mary and Joseph. They're probably not on your list because our spotlight is just a couple of sentences. It's not a big movie theater that we have about this great love story, but it is a great love story when you extract from it. If we examine the two in their relationship and look at just these couple of passages, you're going to see a love of a man, a great love that a man has for a woman, that he would do anything he could to protect her and love her and be with her. And it's something that we overlook a lot in our society is we don't look at this, we focus, and it is, it is the focus is all about Jesus, but I want to look a little bit about the man and the character of it. I want you to examine the love between the two of them and realize it is a love that stood the test of time because of the aspects this morning. So let's look in, in uh, chapter 1, verses 18 through 25, and we'll start there, and it says, this is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was, a, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because she, what she's conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. 
She will give birth to a son, and you will give him the name of Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord said to the prophet, the virgin will be conceived will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke, he did what he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary to be his wife, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son and he gave him the name of Jesus. The first thing I want you to see here is what I have happy expectations. If you look in the first part of the verse, it has up here just, just the very first one. This is how the birth of Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married with Joseph. We're going to stop right there. So the first part of this story is very happy expectations. We understand, you need to understand, that a Jewish marriage consisted in three parts. Okay? And back then, especially you young people, you probably wouldn't like this, all right? You had a, a, a two dads. Most of the dads, not even where the mom was involved, though I'm sure they were in the background because they were good men, a good woman, right? And so the two men would get together and say, hey, I think it'd be best if your son and my daughter, when they got together and they, they had holy matrimony and we could, be, we could be friends, it was a partnership, we're families. I mean, way back in the Old Testament, it was almost like an alliance of, of armies. You know, your whole family clan is going to join my whole family clan. If anybody attacks us, you got my back, I got yours, right? Because we're family. And that's how it kind of started. They, they believed and that they came and they set up the marriage. And they said, hey, that sounds like a good idea. I think it would be a great partnership. And so they would marry the two or betroth them together. You know, they didn't have the belief. And, you know, some of you parents and grandparents may agree with this. They didn't think that young, wide-eyed, young people possessed the wisdom to make a decision that would be best beneficial for every party involved. And so they're like, well, we're not going to do that. I remember, I don't, my dad's not here, neither my sister, I'm going to embarrass. I remember my, my dad embarrassed my sister one day and uh, was working with this guy at work. And they were in the elevator. He looked over at him. The guy kind of worked for him. So he kind of put him in a bind. He said, you know what? I've got a daughter about your age. Would you mind taking her out? And I kid you not, my sister hid in her bedroom for a long time. He said, hey, you're going to go out with this guy. I mean, how do you turn your boss down? You know, well, sure, boss, you know, you never met her or nothing, right? And uh, the thing is, that's technically how my grandfather introduced my dad to my mom. And it didn't, well, my mom tried to get rid of him, but the old saying is the squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? And so we're not going to get into their marriage betroth betrothal, but that's kind of how it is. Granddaddy brought daddy home, said, you're going to take my daughter out. And my mom's like, okay, I'll show him a a time he'll never forget and took him to a bowling alley which my dad had never been in before and beat the socks off of him had a cheering section saying i'm going to take this country bumpkin and get him gone he's never going to want to be around again and lo and behold he kept coming so they didn't believe that young people possess the wisdom to make a decision that would impact their whole family and that was the first thing, is that they would meet and make an agreement. Well, the next step was called betrothal, and that is where we have Joseph and Mary. During this time of marriage, it was actually a legal signed document, and they were considered husband and wife. And it was at this time that preparations would be made for the family to come together, or him to go and do his family. He would go start building a house for him, a place normally close to his family he'd be making a place for them they'd be just kind of developing the relationship and normally it lasted about a year jesus talks about that and uses the illustration about his returning that when he is gone that he's going to return back that he is the groom and that we as his people are the bride and that he has to go away for a while to prepare a place for us right and he used their culture to say you we have to be ready just like they were ready. And he would go and he'd start building the house. And they, it was, you can imagine the, the bustle and the hustle and everything that he's, he's getting ready and he's working. He's building a house for him and his wife. And it's going to be kind of a surprise, right? She doesn't get to be a part of it yet. They're not quite living together. And he's making a place for them. And he's going away and getting this all ready. And he says, but then 
the whisper's coming. He's almost done. He's coming. And the people all start gathering. And they're saying, no one knows the day and the time that the groom is coming back, right? He's going to make that decision. But when it's getting close, you start getting the bustle, right? And it talks about, he gives the parable to the ten virgins. And they, they know he's coming. He's coming soon. And they went and had the oil in the lamps. And he said, you better be ready. Because when he comes, what happens? They were supposed to have the, the feast and the wedding and everything set up. And they, as soon as he walked in, you would have people make an announcement. The groom is here. The groom is here. And everybody get up. And they immediately went into the fest. And they had a huge festivity of the marriage. And folks, this is what's symbolic of Christ coming back. He said the trumpet will blow. Nobody knows the date and the time. And when they come, you better be ready. Your spirit, your soul better be ready for the groom to return. Because if you're not, you're going to be left out. And that's this point. Joseph is getting ready. He's betrothed to her. He, he's getting everything ready. He's got plans. And I can imagine, as, as I don't know how old he is, but he's, you can imagine, men. I mean, you're, you've got all these plans. I'm going to make my house like this. I'm going to build this. I'm going to surprise her. This is going to be great. We're going to have picket fences. I'm going to have a tree stand. We're going to have all kinds of kids. We're going to have 10 kids. I better build 10 bedrooms. You know, I don't know. Whatever it is, he's got plans, right? And he's getting all excited. Why? Because he's getting everything ready for his wife. Well, lo and behold, <laughs> he gets terrible disappointment. And that's the second point we got. So we have on here, 19, he's getting ready. He's betrothed to her. But before they came together, he found out she was pregnant through the Holy Spirit. So, I can't imagine the disappointment when his new, soon-to-be wife must have come to him or met with him somehow and said, Hey, I got great news. Well, what's that, darling? Uh, I'm having God's son. <laughs> what? I'm having a baby. It, but it, it, don't worry. It's nobody here in town. It's God himself. I'm, I'm pregnant. So you can imagine him being all excited about building a building. And I'm sure all he heard was there was nothing about God's son. There's nothing about, hey, it's God's child. It was, I'm pregnant. And in his world, that means somebody else and her got together, right? And I'm sure there's a big disappointment, you know, because, you know, us men are selective hearing. This whole thing about God and kids and stuff, you know, probably didn't resonate too well. He probably just heard pregnant and everything else shut off, you know. But we are, right? It was only later that he started getting that, hey, God did this. And then I'm sure the next word in his mind is, she's crazy. Not only has she lost my trust not only has she broke our promise she's nuts she's flat crazy now a lot of men think that anyway not necessarily true but i'm sure that he himself felt jilted i'm sure that he was crushed i, I guarantee you the disappointment in, in anybody who has been married in your life for any reason about the time, or even when you're young and married in the honeymoon phase and everything they do right, I mean, they always smell good, you know, everything smells good. Then the real station hits that, man, they have some morning breath that will knock your socks off, you know. Maybe you start to see pimples you didn't see before or flaws or whatever. It's not so cutesy anymore, right? A little ticks or something that you had that was cute before now it becomes annoying whether it's grinding the teeth or not or the snoring or you know oh that's so sweet you know now it's like hey, you're snoring <laughs> you know wake up it's not cute anymore you know I had once someone told me that you know that you're in love when you can stand over the one that you love and watch them peacefully laying in sleep. And so as a young man, you're thinking, oh, that's so sweet. I can watch my angel right there, you know, and not that I don't love you, darling, but, you know, every now and then we get a little clogged and it's like, you know, <laughs> not real peaceful. 
It's not like, you know, the trumpets that play the fear or whatever. And it's the same way I've been recorded when I was sleeping, you know, to prove that I snore. But he is disappointed. He has crushed. All his dreams have been crushed. But here's where it talks about Joseph and how you handle disappointment. And this is something we can extract. It tells a lot about the man himself. In verse 19, it said, Joseph, because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, yet didn't want to expose her to public disgrace, he had a mind to divorce her quietly. Joseph had every right to take her all the way up to the front gate of Nazareth and have her stoned. He had every right. He could have disgraced her. He could have pointed out to her. He could have called her names. You are an adulterer. You're a liar. You have jilted me. And everything would have been rectified. And he would have been cleaned. Oh, poor Joseph. You know, let's go do him a favor. Let's go do this. The law said he could have done all that and been fine. His reputation would have been restored. Everything would have been there. She would have been completely disgraced. They would have done anything they could to just get her away, kill her, whatever, because she committed adultery against him. She could be stoned to death. That was the way it is. But he did not decide to do that because apparently he had a love for her. You know, it, it's just amazing during that point in that time that God chose this righteous man, and that speaks a lot of him, that for something about him was like, I don't want her to die. Not only do I want her to die, I don't want her to be disgraced. So I'm going to try to tuck this away the best I can, and maybe I can start over again. And something I think we can extract from that is I wonder, in all of us who are married, how do you respond when your spouse disappoints you? Because they will. I thank my wife all the time for sticking me around and not trading me in for a younger model. <laughs> now I'm starting to think, well, don't trade me in. She's like, oh, I'll never do that. And the other day I said, well, okay, don't trade me in for a richer model. And there was like, silence. <laughs> <laughs> but my thing is, when you disappoint, how do you respond? Do you lash out in your disappointment? Do you become verbal or physically abusive? Do you start just annihilating them with your mouth? And I've shared this once before and I've shared it again because I know we have some new people in here. You know, when we were younger and as you're younger and you're married, you're trying to work things out. And I always had a, a really hot temper when I was younger. I mean, a really hot temper. And one of the things, we'd start getting into an argument. And it would be over something little. But see, the best thing I would do is, like, if something happened, I just, many times I tried to just let things roll off, roll off, and forget yeah. about it. And then we'd get into a small argument. And then I'd start getting mad because she's coming at me with things, and it's like, ooh, you know, I'll, one after another. I'll call it, you know, using the arsenal of your marriage from things past to come forward you know, things get, get brought up. You get to an argument, you know, my brain is like an etch sketch sometimes, and you just shake my head and it's gone, right? When, well, women, I don't know what it is. Y'all got this base somewhere of these awesome, you know, arsenal of things to bring up that come back like way back like the day before you and you can ask her to marry you or something and you messed up and somehow now you burnt the toast. That has something to do with it, you know? Well, anyway, so we're we getting a fight. And I've been getting mad. I'm trying to process everything she's telling me. And she, she, most of the time, she's right, God. You know what I mean? But it was a bombard of stuff. And so I start getting mad. And so I start walking away. Her perception of that was that I was being rude, leaving her there, that we weren't trying to work it out. I was walking away from her. What I was doing was trying to process it. And I knew I was getting mad. And so I needed to get away. I needed to sit down. I needed to roll through everything she was throwing at me, right? But like a little chihuahua, she, she, she followed me. <laughs> and then finally, it blew. And it took her by surprise. Because I don't even know, we don't even know what the arguments were over. But it was over, I know the, the times I've exploded, and it's been small. 
and which took her by surprise that I would just react in such a lasting way. And folks, I never had to raise my hand because my mouth, for whatever reason, like when I get mad, I can bring up the Proverbs 31 woman really quick and quote it verbatim <coughs> and beat you down with the Bible about being disrespectful, using God's word as the wrong text and the wrong thing. And it was enough to do that. How do you do that, men? When you're disappointed or you're bombarded, do you reach out that way? That's not the way to do it. Now, I can honestly say, learning each other over the years, it was one of those first years that we learned. She realizes now, if I'm having to step back, let me step back. It's not because I'm being disrespectful to her. It's that I need time to process. But the other thing is, you know, I didn't make it right going up on her. And unfortunately, it often happens, and it's inexcusable. You know, I'll, I'll tell you right now, men, and I, this world, for whatever reason, is, is making this less and less like it's a problem. Our role is to protect our women and our daughters. We're to protect them from the outside world and the, and the, and the wolves out here that want to hurt them. But you also are there to protect them from yourself. You're there to love them and be, uh, raise them up and encourage them and get behind them and see if they have dreams and see what they can do to support them. Whatever it is, you're the one that's supposed to help make them better. And you, sir, because you are close niche to your spouse, can either raise your wife up or you can crush her. And same with the women. Men have dreams and aspirations, and if you start to nag them and you start bringing them down, or you see that they tried something and they failed, and you start bringing that up anytime he starts to try something again, you know what? He will never try anything. He will stay where he's at. Why? Because he doesn't want to hear and be reminded of his failures. It's all about our, our two together, and that's the application. Joseph could have killed her. He could have stoned her. He could have done anything, but he didn't. And instead, what he do is he, he decided the best thing that he could do was try to do this quietly, not to disgrace her, not to embarrass her. He went to put her away side. Joseph, Joseph demonstrated a great love for Mary by willing to do so. Someone said that love is blind and marriage is an institution. Therefore, marriage is an institution for the blind. And that is the truth. You know, I had a pastor tell me when I was in college, I went to this uh, young minister's class early in the morning down there at Lakeview Baptist Church and we had this old pastor that was there and he had such a great spirit and a great soul. And he told us in there, he said, I can see how much a man loves his wife by looking at his tongue. And we're like, what? He said, from how many scars he's had on it for doing this. <laughs> Folks, 1 Corinthians 13 about love is defined by this. It says, if I speak in tongues of men or of angels and do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or clashing symbol. If I have a gift of prophecy and the fathom of all the mysteries and all the knowledge, and if I have faith that can move a mountain, but I have not love, I am nothing. If I give all that I possess to the poor and give my body to hardship that I may boast, but I do not have love, I have nothing. But this is true love. This is true love, young people. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. And it keeps no record of wrongs. The first thing you need to see in verse 4, love is patient and kind. It is not self-seeking of your own. It has no record of the wrong. It doesn't delight the evil, but it rejoices in the truth. And it always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. And it always perseveres. 
So in Joseph's story, we see a happy expectation of muscle and bustle for new life, for this new bride. And then we see great disappointment when that person let him down or he thought they did. Folks, true love is about patience. In this world, we want everything right now. We, it's all about lust. It's not about love. Love is patient. Ladies, having a guy pressure you into some kind of intimacy before he puts a gold band on your ring or on your finger is not love. It's infatuation. It's patient. If a man respects you, or men, you are to respect a woman in such a way that you don't pressure her into those things. If she wants to wait till marriage, you ought to honor that. You ought to respect that. And you ought to believe in that because she saved herself for you. And vice versa for each other. Love is patient and keeps no records of wrong. And it always, this is what I love, it always delights in truth, it protects, it trusts, and it hopes, and it perseveres. So with that, in our story, getting back to our story, we have the expectation, the happy expectations, we have disappointment, but then we have a joyful real, uh, realization. Look in verse 20. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Because what she conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And she will give birth to a son, and you will give him the name of Jesus, because he will save his people from his sin. So as you know, Mary, the story doesn't end with divorce. It ends with him getting what? The truth. He was disappointed. He didn't immediately run out there and stone her. He didn't immediately go out there and disgrace her. He did the right thing to try to protect her, to try to do something that would not embarrass her. And so the angel comes to him and says, listen, we want you to understand that she is truthful. She loves you. She wants to be with you. And what she tells you is of God and is of the truth. And I can't imagine all of a sudden being suddenly crushed and disappointed in someone that you love that the realization that the truth happens and you're just excited and elated and you're just, you can't, I can't imagine I bet he popped up and tried to sit in the middle of the night and went to find Mary and said it's true, it's true I'm sure that the joy just said I just appeared, the angel came to me and told me the same thing, you're not crazy I'm excited I don't have to dispose of you I can keep you I can't imagine. One of the things that popped in my head, I'm a big Andy Griffith fan, is there is a show called Mr. Jingles. And it's Gopi, and he meets this guy, and he's a tree climber. And he's got a silver helmet, he's got little tinsels on him, and they called him Mr. Jingles. And he climbed up in the tree with the power lines or whatever up in the tree to climber. And he, Mr. Jingles gave him like a souvenir, I can't remember what it was. And so he's telling, Opie's telling his dad where he got it from. Well, Mr. Jingles did. And he, he works up in the treetops. He goes from tree to tree. And he's like, Opie, don't lie to me. Right? And the whole thing is about Opie lying to him. And, and Andy gets so mad. And Opie's sitting there telling him, but I'm telling you the truth. So I'm telling you. And so Andy doesn't know what to do. So he walks out into the woods. And he's holding that little tool or whatever it is that Mr. Jingles gave him and he just started saying Mr. Jingles, Mr. Jingles, Mr. Jingles and lo and behold Mr. Jingles came down in his silver hat and all his tools and Andy went nuts he about yanked the man's head off you know or shaked his hands he was so excited that Opie had not been lying to him that's a small scale story of what I can imagine Joseph when he found out the truth he went running to her you know the thrill that must have been there, you know, I've actually heard a story of a guy that I know that his wife, he had gone and of course they'd had kids and they made a decision that he would go and no longer be able to have kids so they wouldn't have them anymore, right? And so, lo and behold, she comes to him one day and she does the same thing Mary does and says, you're not going to believe this, I'm pregnant. And he said, excuse me? And she said, I'm pregnant. And she was doing the same thing Mary told him. It's yours. And no, no, it's not. It's not mine. And there was a huge disappointment in their marriage. And he started distrusting her. And he thought she was lying to him. And eventually, with today's technology, they went and did a DNA test. And lo and behold, it's his. And he said, 
the elation that I had, I felt excited and I also felt disappointed in myself for not believing her at the same time. But I was more excited because apparently what he had done had come undone and it was his child. <coughs> And but he said the heartache, it's his testimony. He said the heartache had almost destroyed us, but I believed in her. He said, I, I knew there was something not right here. And he said it almost ripped him apart. But the truth came about. Folks, I can't imagine what he went through when he he uh, found out that she's not lying to him. Which then rolls over to my final point, which is amazing faith, which is seen. So it says here, when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord said, had commanded him, and took Mary to be his wife. And he had no union with her until she gave birth to her son. Now, now that they were husband and wife, living together, sharing a home, he prepared for them. Joseph's doubts had been swept away. He looked forward to the anticipation. I'm sure there was other stuff going on. In his mind, first I know that there was embarrassment. I can't imagine, you know, being in a small town of Nazareth. You know, they're going to find out that they've only been married for two or three months, but she started to show seven months. You know, I can't imagine. You know, he's going around with his guy friends like, "Hey, what's up with this? You only been married for like three months." You know, oh, hey, you won't believe this. An angel came to me. That's that's God's kid. Say, say what? You crazy, man. You know, I'm sure that was probably what it is. I don't know what they probably came up with, but I'm sure everybody else in town did not come up with it. You know, they probably like, oh, he's just, why don't he just admit that they, they two didn't, you know, keep to their vows and messed up or whatever. Why don't they just admit to it? I can't imagine the gossip and embarrassment that they had to pay for. You know, I almost want to think that when he was told and got the, the, when the, they had to go and, and register in Bethlehem. There might have even been somewhat of a relief that he got out of Nazareth to go 80 miles to Bethlehem. Because I can imagine the small gossip in the town that they were having to endure during this time of this pregnancy, but he was all about it. All the things that he was doing, I'm sure that his reputation was tarnished because, I mean, how did he respond? We don't know. But we know that he was a righteous man. We know that he was a truthful man. We know that he loved his wife. So why wouldn't he tell the truth? The angel came and told me. I doubt anybody believed it. But the thing I also want you to see is when they arrived in Bethlehem. And he said, all of this, you know, the angel said, that is to fulfill the passage of the, of the prophecy. And Joseph did what he was, he was commanded to do and took his wife and he took her to Bethlehem. And it was just the two of them. The travel was hard. I mean, ladies, I can't imagine. She was nine months. Right? It's literally 80 miles with donkey or walking from there to Bethlehem. I can't imagine what Mary went through. I'm sure it wasn't pleasant. You know, when you potty breaks, everything going on, rough times. And the other thing that I, I had missed throughout this time, it never dawned on me. I've always looked at the nativity scenes and I've always looked at everything and it never really just dawned on me. It was just Joseph there to deliver his kid. I didn't think about it. Never really thought about it. Joseph had to deliver this child by himself. There was nobody else there. It was him and Mary in a stable. And so he was there for her to wipe her brow. He was there for her to, to be there for her. He was there to cut the umbilical cord of his child. He was probably the one that cleaned him up and wrapped him in the swaddling cloak. He was it. That's all we got. We don't have any midwives or anything else stated in the Bible. It was the two of them. No other gospel says that anybody else was there. Except the animals. I doubt they were any help. But that's what we got. We got a man, and that's what I'm saying about this Christmas story. What we can learn about Joseph is that even though he was a man of a great expectation too, and then also experienced great disappointment, only to be reinvigorated by the truth of God showing that this is, that you see 
that through it all, you have a man, and this is why God chose him, who was a righteous man, and he was there through really, really tough times. Folks, this is a love story. This is a love story that we don't ever really talk about. There's a man that, and a woman that went through heartache. I'm sure they went through embarrassment. They went through a rough time. And they, they were chosen to be the family of God our Almighty King. Folks, what I hope that y'all extract this morning is that the greatest love story of all time is Christmas. The greatest love story that we can have is that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will have everlasting life. And these people brought that forth in a manger, not of grandeur. And he said he came into this world to experience the lowest of lows amongst two people who had to go through a rough, rough time together of doubt and mistrust but they came together because why the love of God conquered all things and we as men and women need to draw near to God so that when we have our marriage together with our spouse that we what we lift each other up we build each other up we're there for our kids to love each other up and as grandparents, you're there to share with your children and your grandchildren the love that God has. And that is the love story of Joseph and Mary, a righteous man who did not give up on his wife. Let's all stand for prayer. Lord, I pray right now that your love story between these two shines through. That anyone who doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Savior can see through this love story between this man and this woman and a God Almighty that came to this earth so that we can be with Him. Lord, I pray right now, if they don't know you, that they come to know you. That He loved us so much that He came to atone us for our sin. Lord, if there's anyone in here that, that feels like they're lost, that let this be the day that they find you. Let this be the day that they lay those burdens at your feet and give their life over to you and say, I will follow you and I will trust you and I'll put faith in you. Lord, let this be the day. Lord, I thank you and I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.